Sounds like it's ripped. Does that work? We'll see how that's going. And if not, we can switch to the other mic. Yeah, okay. So we're Hello. We're going to be going right into the next session. There's, uh, in order to keep to the break time at the end of this session. I'm Nettie Legassi, and this uh, session, and the moderator for this session, which is beyond the article. Uh, tracking other research outputs. We've got five speakers uh, for your engagement and uh, reaction, and each speaker will be about 15 minutes, and I'll be the timekeeper and um, uh, putting questions to the audience. Um, the, way, the format that I was thinking of was uh, 15 minutes for each speaker and the questions to the speaker at the end of their talks. Uh, and um, the first speaker is Josh Barrow from Durham, Durham University, um, who will be talking about what he's going to tell you. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. Uh, hi. Is this, is this thing working? Is that? No? Yeah. yeah? Okay, good. Um, so I'm Josh Borrow, as you said, from Durham University, and I've been working quite a lot recently with, in collaboration with Pedro Russo at Leiden University. He, uh, he runs the Universe Awareness Project, which I don't know if you know about it, but it's quite a large outreach project. Um, so what, what we've been thinking about recently a lot is how can we motivate more individual researchers to go out there and engage the public? Because at the moment, there's not that many people, and the people that do it are kind of like people that really love doing outreach and engaging the public. So how can we make it more part of their, their career? Um, and what I'm going to talk about is mainly based on our experiences and a little bit of published research, because in our opinion, a lot of the, public uh, uh, a lot of the available research on this has a large amount of self-selection bias in it, and so you can't really draw that many conclusions. So I'm sorry there's not that many citations, um, but just ask some people at your university. I'm sure you'll get similar ideas. So um, the main reason that we get for people not engaging with the public is that they say that they have a lack of time, um, which kind of makes sense. It, I, to me, it's not so much a lack of time, but a lack of time that they see as w worth investing in, in engaging the public because they can't afford to spend this time engaging the public because you need to spend it all on research. And that's really because there's no career development available at all in a lot of research universities around the world for engaging the public. And that's something that I think we, we really need to change. <coughs> so this all comes at a time when public engagement is becoming quite a large part of universities' culture. Um, a lot of research universities are describing public engagement as their third aim, which is, seems a little disingenuous, considering that they don't have it in their career recognition programs. Um, and at the same time, people are being forced out of doing public engagement. There was a paper published recently with 40 UK researchers that were interviewed, and a lot of them had to stop doing their public engagement research because they were afraid of basically being sacked because they weren't producing enough um, research output. Um, and this public engagement really is good for the universities, and we want to promote it because it's great for their sort of, their, um, sorry, my phone is going crazy. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's really good for their, like, um, undergraduate admissions, sort of getting towards funding and sort of proving that their research has impact. And we're still using those outdated career development programs that were sort of generated many, many years ago that are all to do with research, and as I'm sure many of you altmetric guys are pretty annoyed about, um, just citations. And so this is all part of a larger problem with um, research careers changing considerably from basic research to producing public s publicly available software, consulting, public engagement, all these things that people are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, Stuff that's undertaken by many, but sort of recognized by few, which is not that great and something that we really need to change. And so what I think we, we need to do is build a flexible framework for people who do public engagement so that it can be evaluated and appraised in a really sort of functional way. Um, this is really difficult to do because of the wide variety of public engagement things that are out there. Um, if you compare giving a public lecture to a thousand school children or closely engaging with 
20 or 30 students on a citizen science project, you really kind of, like, which one is better? Different people will have different views. And so it's very difficult to come up with sort of one number that really represents all of that. And so I think what we really need is a person in there. And so in short, what we really want to do is um, move towards a system where, similar to research, you have a mentor, and that mentor gives you sort of backup when it comes to working out how good your engagement is. Um, and maybe that will take more time away from research, but I think it's worth it based upon, well, what I said previously. Um, so, what do we want to achieve? We want to achieve more integration of public engagement with research, uh, more engagement overall, and a pro-engagement atmosphere in the universities, which just isn't there at the moment. And I'm not saying that everyone should engage with the public. I think we all know that that would be a bit of a disaster. Um, just that time that's spent on good research is sort of treated equally by funding agencies and research institutions as time that's spent on doing good public engagement. And so this is kind of a quick system that me and Pedro came up with over this summer to sort of run around. Um, so start in the top left, mentor meeting, sort of set goals for the next year, uh, look at what you did last year, offer training if it's applicable to what you want to do this year, give advice and sort of an initial evaluation of what you want to do. And this should be documented for reasons that I'm going to talk about later. Move around to the planning stage, that's pretty obvious, just like write your talk, but document it and obviously have the advisor or mentor available there for, for advice. Third round is the secondary meeting, which is interim evaluation. We've heard a little bit about this in the last section, so just making sure that you're on track and all the goals are being satisfied. Um, and again, collect a lot of data in this, um, as well as the implementation stage, where there's a summative evaluation, obviously after you've done whatever it is that you're planning on doing. Um, and focus on documenting the narrative rather than searching for learning impacts. I'm not talking here about big um, sort of engagement projects. I'm talking about individual researchers doing little things for their community that are just completely just disregarded at the moment. Um, and so just discuss and talk about how well the event went, and that can be your evaluation because it's very difficult to come up with learning impacts without spending most of your time on measuring those. But what this really requires is funding bodies and research institutions to stop asking for lots of these learning impacts and things from individual researchers at that level, which are very difficult to, um, to provide. And I'm saying this as a practitioner, I'm sure some of the people who do funding out there will disagree with me greatly. Um, and just focus on good quality narratives. Did I press the right button? Yeah. And so all that data collection I was talking about before should be put into a public engagement portfolio for each individual researcher, um, which can be sort of displayed next to a list of publications when going for career development opportunities and things. So you have solid evidence there to back up why your research may not be as good as this other guy that spends all of his time doing research and you spend half of your time engaging the public for your whole group or something. Um, and the research in institution should also be able to use this data to discuss about how good their public engagement is, what groups are doing better, which sort of departments are doing better and things like that. And so this is actually meant to be a boardroom table. Um, I tried illustrating these slides, but I don't know if it went that well. Um, <laughs> and so what this really also requires from institutions is to use this data. Your staff are doing public engagement on a daily basis and they're getting nothing from it. And I can understand why, because there isn't any real sort of evidence there that they've done it. But if there is, then you have to use it. And so that's why we think that perhaps there should be someone who's experienced in public engagement or is a public engagement professional on these sort of funding councils and big um, boards discussing career development. I'm nearly done. So similar work. Um, this was done by the Open University in the UK. It kind of scooped us a little bit, which is slightly annoying. Sorry if there's anyone from the Open University. Um, and what they did was they focused on career development for public engagement people. Um, and they compensated them for doing public engagement as sort of a substitute for doing research. Um, and this led to a lot of overdue promotions, an increase in engaged research 
throughout the university. So the blue line is uh, the initial one, and then the red is the predicted after three years, and the green is where they actually are after three years. And so as you can see, all of these qualities have increased because they've promoted engagement within their university and engaged research as well. And so conclusions. Kind of, maybe it's been a bit disingenuous for me to talk about this without telling you my real reason. It's that we need help as the public engagement community in developing metrics and ways to study public engagement from you guys who know all about this sort of stuff. We're practitioners. We, we don't really know what we're doing. Um, <laughs> And basically, <laughs> research institutions, please include public engagement in your um, career development programs because you like it when we do it, so come on. <laughs> um, so we've released a longer paper about this. Uh, you can read on the archive, and I'll tweet it afterwards. But uh, thank you for listening, and here's how you can contact me. Oh wow, that was way yeah. Quicker. Thank you, Josh. You did you did uh, use your time very uh, wisely. Let's say so. There is a time for a few questions for Josh. Uh, does anyone have uh, things they'd like to ask or pause it? Yes, one. I have a, just a question. How do you, how do you identify when you have consider public engagement to have taken place? Like you know, when do you uh, what point or what what kind of this is just a question around how do people yeah. that work doing public engagement? What is like the um, I don't want to say metric, but what is the standard by which you define when the public has actually engaged with the resources? Is it when they look so at it, when they act on it, when they talk back? Wh what is it that so you So, I mean, it's it's like I was saying before, it's very difficult to measure when the actual people have engaged and got something out of it. But I think, for me, the issue is that there's a lot of effort being put into this by researchers. And n there's that's very easily measurable. And so I think maybe the way that it should be measured is if you're putting effort in, and if you've got things that are easy to measure, like attendance numbers, if you gave a public talk and 150 people came, then you can measure that. And then you can say, this is something that I've done, this is something I spend my time on. So I don't know if I quite answered your, your question there. So, because I, I was a bit confused about what you... No, um, yeah, so I mean, it does are, I think, yeah, this is like saying, well, you should, you measure it by whatever you, can measure with, and, and so I don't. I'm yeah. just asking more, even on the on uh, on the philosophical level. Like, what do you think is considered okay? Someone has engaged with this resource, right? So let's say I put okay. something out on Twitter, and then okay, this is the number of impressions. Is it the number of downloads, or is it evidence that they used it in practice somewhere? Is that engagement? I think I think maybe the sort of impression level metrics are probably more appropriate here, mm -hmm. because like I was saying, these guys are just like individual people, and. I mean, I, I know I'm going back to your point of saying measure with what you can measure with, but you can't measure with anything else, you know? <laughs> so I think, yeah, hopefully, hopefully I've in a roundabout way answered your question. So are there any, are there any others? Any other questions? Uh, that was a very difficult one. <laughs> <laughs> no? Okay. Well, thank you for allowing me to speak here. And you can uh, tweet, tweet to Josh. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. fast. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, so the next uh, speaker is uh, Robin Hochschild. Did I say your name right? Okay. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> I don't know if you want the mic or the lavalier. Turning on the timer. Hmm? I'm going to give 15 minutes and I'll start the timer. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank you for the introduction and the possibility to talk here. Um, as my title suggests, I'm presenting some work about Mendeley readers. And on the next slide, I'd like to 
rephrase my title into three different research questions. The first one, are there differences and similarities between um, bookmarking papers in the scientific disciplines of Mendeley readers or reader counts? Second, um, can we see some difference in the career stages between bookmarking papers on Mendeley and which groups of researchers read similar or different papers? And third, um, can we see some interesting thing about the countries? These are the three main uh, things we can break Mendeley readers down to. Um, I'll skip the Mendeley introduction slide because uh, um, there was a nice talk previously in the morning session and uh, I think it's better to save time and skip this part. So um, we've taken the DOIs from about 1.2 million articles and reviews, mostly of course articles um, from the Web of Science. Those are all articles and reviews with the DOI published in 2012. And we searched for those DOIs in the Mendeley application programming interface and found for about 95% of the articles and about 97% of the reviews Mendeley reader counts of some amount, some one, some higher. And in total, we recorded more than 9 million Mendeley reader counts. So this uh, retrieval was broken down into academic status, disciplinary affiliation, and uh, the country information. For the status information, um, it seems to be some mandatory piece of information. Uh, I've uh, received um, uh, the same number. Uh, if I sum up all the reader counts and if I sum up all the status disciplines and sum, sum over the papers. So uh, for 100% of the papers, I received status um, information and also every, every uh, reader count for each paper had some status information attached to it. Well, for, for every reader count was status information attached. This was different for the country and for the discipline information. For the country information, um, only about 16.8, 16 16% um, uh, of the reader counts we found had some uh, country information attached to it. And if you ha have a look at, at it in another perspective, about half of the articles and about two thirds of the reviews had some country information attached to them. This means at least one reader count has some country information and there might be 99 without. For the discipline information, it was rather interesting that we found 99.95% of the Mendeley reader counts with discipline information. This means it's not, it's not mandatory, but most users do provide it. The first network I would like to present is that one about the scientific disciplines, and we found ma uh, mainly four disciplinary groups. The green one, um, biomedical group, uh, the red and pink one, mainly built at, uh, up out of social science, humanities, and connected computer sciences. Uh, the blue one is more something like uh, natural science, engineering, and uh, the yellow one is more biology and, ge and geology centered earth science, environmental science, and stuff like that. Um, considering the morning talk of William Gunn, uh, that um, bio uh, biology is very uh, predominant on Mendeley uh, in the total user base. It's completely understandable that we have two different clusters of uh, biology, uh, bio uh, bio biology related um, uh, users. Um, but social science and humanities was not that popular or uh, that highly populated among the Mendeley readers. And so it's a bit surprising that we have really sizable amounts of uh, Mendeley, Mendeley reader counts providing uh, the information I'm working on the social science, humanities, what have you. Uh, for all discipline information, we see that the miscellaneous edition um, pops up very much. We also found that most of the uh, discipline information uh, was put into some miscellaneous uh, 
uh, definition. There are some exceptions like in chemistry, we have analy analytic chemistry, organic, inorganic chemistry, we have chemical engineering. Those are more specific subdisciplines, but um, yeah, the largest ones are the, multi uh, um, are the miscellaneous ones. So as I said, we have four different networks, and in terms of number of uh, disciplines, this is not the reader count ratio, but uh, in terms of number of uh, disciplinary affiliations, um, the second network with the social, social sciences and humanities is, is the largest one. It has the most disciplines in this group. And the second largest is uh, the one with the biomedical sciences. And, uh, no, the um, natural sciences, afterwards the biomedical sciences, and then the biology and geosciences. We'll have a look closer look at the social sciences and humanities, and afterwards into the biomedical and natural science network. So here is the social science and humanities network uh, with connection lines. Uh, and here we also see uh, the core is mainly constructed by the miscellaneous subgroup. And um, then there are yeah, loosely connected uh, disciplines around. Here we have the biochemistry and uh, medical uh, network. Again, a similar picture, mainly the miscellaneous uh, subdiscipline is uh, uh, the most uh, important one or most populated one. Uh, the next uh, type of network I would like to show is the status group network. Um, here we also uh, know from the morning talk that the PhD students, especially uh, the people in younger or early career stages, are more prominent on Mendeley than other people. And this is also reflected, uh, reflected in this network. So we found a very high amount of PhD students, master students, postdocs, and they are highly interconnected to each other. Actually, every uh, status group is connected to each other st status group in the, in the network directly. And uh, as a third uh, part, I promised to show the country uh, groups. And there we found, again, four different groups, two which are the most interesting. Uh, we have uh, 53 nations that uh, seem to be the core to the scientific enterprise, judging on, uh, of course, many reader counts and the publication in 2012 and the Web of Science coverage. And most OECD countries are present, plus Russia and China. I will show this network on the next slide. And the second uh, network is constructed by 115 nations centered around Brazil and India. And Norway, as one of the OECD countries, is in the second ne network. The third and fourth network are groups of very small, uh, or are very small groups of uh, rather small countries, which I will not show separately. So this is the group one, the OEC mainly OECD country uh, group. Uh, the blue, d uh, the green dot between Germany and Japan is France. Um, we see uh, that the United States, United Kingdom are contributing most in this network, uh, followed by Germany, France, Japan, and Canada. And um, yeah, some of these uh, um, countries around the edge don't seem to fit well into the, um, yeah, in into the group of the other countries, but uh, they have uh, obviously many reader connections. The second uh, group is, uh, as I said, centered around Brazil and Mexico. And uh, well, it has also some smaller countries around the edges. And uh, the main countries which contribute are in the center of the network. I have uh, four take home messages. So in terms of uh, scientific disciplines, we found four groups. Um, one, biology and geosciences. Two, social science and humanities, including the relevant computer sciences. Three, biomedical sciences. And four, natural science and uh, engineering. 
and in all four groups, the category with the additional miscellaneous uh, is the most populated. As a second tank home message, uh, the social science and humanities have a surprisingly pronounced position in the networks. Um, furthermore, the most pronounced academic status uh, in the networks is formed by the students. Well, they're in the earliest career stages you might think of, uh, which uh, contribute uh, to Mendeley as well as to the scientific process. And um, we have a lot of master students and postdocs. Finally, the de decomposition in terms of nations mainly separa um, separates developed from, from less developed nations, uh, with some exceptions. And um, I've posed some research questions in the beginning. Uh, the first answer to the uh, first research question was already the first take home message. Um, the second uh, research questions about uh, uh, the professional status could be answered by the network of co-readers in terms of professional status shows that Mendeley is mainly shared among PhD students, master students and postdocs. Uh, maybe with the addition that um, all the other groups are connected to each other group, which is not the case in the other two networks, by the way. And um, the third research question was about the countries. The country network focuses on global readership patterns. It identifies a group of 53 nations that are core to the scientific enterprise, including most OECD countries, Russia and China. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Robin. We do have uh, time for some questions. If anyone's got any? Is that, oh, sorry. Hi, my name is uh, Hans Selstra. I have a question on your chart where you were showing uh, Norway as part of the Brazil group. Do you have yeah. any explanation for that? Um, well, my, uh, my explanation is mainly that it has co-reader occurrences with um, Brazil, in this case Norway, and, uh, and quite some, uh, qu quite many, because they are closely uh, connected in this, um, uh, this network. And both uh, contribute a lot, and, uh, and the distance is relative to the, to the strength of the coupling between those two. So um, it's just an observation, but I didn't find any explanation. I guess ideas welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I missed what the links between the uh, positions mean. So you had, reached, you had all these different positions, and then there were thick lines between some and very thin between others? Yeah, uh, for, the, for the status groups, yeah. this one, yeah. uh, the thicker the line, uh, the more connections you're having. So uh, or, um, let's say co-bookmarkings, co-bookmarking events. So the line between uh, student PhD and postdoc is very thick and even between student master and student PhD is even thicker. And that means you have many more co-bookmarking events between these through these two groups and these two groups compared to, let's say, student bachelor and student PhD, or librarian and student PhD. There are some, but there are less. Last question. I would just like to ask whether you, the sample you took from Web of Science, uh, did that include the uh, data from the recent partnership they have with uh, Shello from Brazil? Um, not if it's uh, not in the core collection. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Robin. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is this a video? Hmm. This is 
is not very um, yeah. dress friendly. I <laughs> no, I think I'll just do it like this. <laughs> okay. Am I? Is this the? I'm, I'm not a PC person either. <coughs> Is the screen right? Okay, good. Okay, I will. Uh, you can point your hand and you can use your point to click on it. Perfect. Yeah. Then I have two hands. If you want. But yeah, I'm not so sure if I'm multitasking uh, today or not. <laughs> Okay. Oh, um, sorry, it's uh, Sunia Dalmai Tyson <laughs> from CERN <laughs> who will be talking next. <laughs> Apologies. Thanks, Letty and uh, Eddie. <laughs> so um, I will be talking about um, high physics and social sciences today, and um, what we do with non-traditional objects, as uh, many people call them. I'm personally not calling them non-traditional <laughs> objects because they are part of our everyday life, um, and we support researchers. Um, this is a talk I've been preparing with Mercy Crusas um, at Harvard because um, I spent half a year at Harvard right now um, and where we um, got the chance to compare what uh, we guys are doing at CERN because that's what I've been working for, where I've been working for um, almost six <coughs> years now and um, what they do at Harvard and um, so it was quite nice to see um, um, how our pictures fit together or um, how they didn't. So um, what I try to sa tell you in the next 10 minutes is um, what actually will come your way to the people who you know, are tracking things and um, are trying to count things and assess impact, etc. Because um, there's much more than just the paper. Um, actually, I think everything I do in my job is um, everything but the paper <laughs> because uh, it's all about data, software, etc., etc. So um, feel free to interrupt me at any time if I use acronyms whatsoever that are not familiar to you because I work at CERN, which is an organization which is built on a, has an acronym as a name. And, um, so yeah, just feel free to um, interrupt me um, or come to me afterwards, of course, um, because it's quite a lo lot of content um, that I try to condense into 10 minutes. So. Um, the basic question is, um, is how could other metrics uh, work for our communities and their research practices? Um, what um, are we trying to work for? Um, we would like to move beyond the article and data paradigm that has been emerging. Um, and I would like to come back to this morning's, um, or actually just a, a couple of um, presentations ago statement, that is, um, we cannot actually assess um, open science because um, you know, it's not really practiced yet. Um, so what we try to do with our services, both at CERN and at Harvard, is support researchers in moving beyond um, just the sharing of um, their article, let it be a preprint or just an open access article, um, or um, the data, but really moving beyond that. So it's um, capturing related materials and research products. Um, at CERN, um, this goes um, quite into the details. Uh, we have software simulations. I can already promise you that, for example, next month we will be sharing tons of Monte Carlo simulations, which is, uh, you can, I leave up to you um, to decide how you track this, for example. Um, we also have tutorials, documentation, a super wide range um, of objects. Um, we try to link these in our services um, the, not only the objects, but also link this to contextual information so that others who um, discover these objects which we put out there, machine readable and human readable, can access them and assess, assess them and know what they can do with this. So it's about contextualization and um, enabling future reuse and reproducibility. I think that's um, important to keep in mind. It's maybe obvious for many here, but I think it's really important to keep in mind that this is like the major goal, and that's why we need to put things into context. I cannot just, you know, um, well I can also could also just push something out there, but we really need to um, provide um, the context. So what we are doing, um, I mean, uh, we are building services, um, has been demanded several times today already, um, but we can lucky, happily do this, um, but if no one uses us, um, this is pretty useless too. So um, what we try to do is building these services together with the community, um, which is also not as straightforward as it seems because um, the tools to share such materials openly are not so straightforward sometimes. It seems sometimes a bit cumbersome, etc. So they should be intrinsic to the research workflows, should be easy um, to tools to use. What we um, and both organizations um, build on quite heavily is the concept of data citation already. Um, 
meaning um, we try um, to build on the traditional paradigm of uh, citation mechanisms to encourage them and get them on board. The question for us is how ALT metrics um, can help us um, in engaging researchers to move um, beyond the traditional sharing mechanisms we already experience and um, engage them in um, this non-traditional um, object sharing. So um, two case studies, I'm looking at um, CERN and um, IQSS at Harvard. Um, I start with the social sciences, um, which is the Dataverse at Harvard project. Um, this is how the data repository looks like. Um, it's predominantly serving the social sciences right now, um, but also reaching out to other communities. So this is how it looks like. Um, this is um, just um, one random data set out of, uh, I think, 400,000 right now. Um, as you see, there's a very prominent data citation, but you also see this very colorful box um, in the top. And if I oh, sorry. <laughs> Which one is it? I will just talk and not just leave this. So you see, see this wonderful um, color bo colorful box and um, where it, it shows, shows you downloads, um, citations, views, and aspects like this, which um, here um, for specific data sets in this um, case, 12 downloads, where you already get an idea of this, where this might be going. Dataverse um, moves further than that um, and integrates with collaborative workspaces, for example. Um, from, for example, from the Center of Open Science, uh, Open Science, they integrate with analytical software, so you could imagine, this is not happening right now, um, preserving code snippets and integrate them as well. They have an automated article data submission system so that researchers can easily combine all the different objects and share them. And you could imagine um, how this um, could be expanded further. Um, I'm moving quickly into um, the, how CERN tackles these aspects. Um, and I'm showing you um, our screenshot of our analysis preservation tool, which we are developing right now. Um, this is a very um, complex uh, submission form, as you can see on the right-hand side. Um, here we um, snapshot um, data. Um, you see um, MC data set path. It's Monte Carlo, what I already told you. This is um, complex um, simulations that are used um, partially to validate um, data sets, uh, et cetera. Trigger selection, physics object, very, very um, discipline-specific stuff that is needed to contextualize materials that we share afterwards and that, for example, alt metrics could track. But it has a huge impact um, on the metadata, obviously. Um, this, is, um, this tool that I just showed to you is in, behind closed doors, but we use the CERN Open Data Portal to push this out. So if you're interested in, um, assess in accessing um, such output, check this out. Um, and um, you can get an idea of um, what um, kind of content we have. Um, we also count um, the stuff, um, sorry, the, stuff, the research objects uh, we are sharing. Um, <laughs> uh, I hope my certain colleagues are not listening. <laughs> so, um, so yes, we are counting the tra non-traditional research objects uh, we are sharing. Um, but right now, and that's one of the reasons why I came here, um, not a very comprehensive way, because we really rely on the conservative um, traditional metrics, as you can see here. I took um, one of our open science enthusiasts um, here. He works for a big um, LHC collaboration, and you can see um, three p um, pillars here, and this is one, uh, one of our core community platforms. Um, personal details on the left, publication uh, and data set output in the, in the center on, on the right hand side, um, citation summary. Um, this is being used heavily um, for um, recruitment, uh, hiring um, procedures. And if you, um, I hope you can read it, um, there's no, even though we are able and we do have data citation um, happening, so we are able to track it. Um, we don't have it there yet. We don't have alt metrics there yet. Um, and um, this is a bit of a chicken and egg problem, again, um, because I mean, there we don't show it because we there is no demand, but maybe we should show it because, um, you know, that would create demand. Um, uh, where should we start um, is a bit of the question here for me. Um, some of my colleagues are, have a more, bit more conservative approach. So this is um, where the content could be shown, where, um, where, where we could um, star and start and make it more comprehensive. 
Anyway, coming to the comparison that I was ta um, starting with, is um, if you ask my colleagues from CERN when I went over um, to Harvard to when was mentioning you know with social sciences, they were like, "What? <laughs> I mean, with, you know, it's so different. I mean, this is, does it make sense, etc." And um, yeah, it seems maybe in the beginning that there's not much overlap, but I can tell you after six months there's quite a huge overlap. So if it, um, if it comes to um, how we expose data and how we can actually track it, I would say there's actually not, much, not so much of a difference. Um, of course, I mean, there are um, tons of differences, the next slide, but there are lots of commonalities. Um, we do um, assign uh, um, persistent identifiers to all citable objects or that we think um, could be cited. We um, make a huge attempt um, to enrich metadata, um, which of course might differ in the detail, but um, we use um, basic standards that are pretty much the same. We do have follow the same paradigms in the sense of um, you know, putting authors into the driving seats, um, support them in the process, build on data citations so that, you know, to get them engaged in the processes. And we do have co um, similar um, opinions on how to facilitate data citation, for example. I know I'm rushing a bit because I think I'm... Right. Yeah. Uh, so um, concerning the differences, um, there are some, I mean, um, obvious things and uh, maybe some surprises. Um, if you, um, we do have um, privacy concerns and confidential data, of course, when it comes to social sciences, which have an impact on how you share, obviously. Uh, but I can tell you also when it comes to LHC data, um, because we have, we have such large collaborations, there are quite some concerns in regard to open science practices too. Um, this is of course not exactly the same, but it results in similar changes, changes uh, challenges in terms of how you close things up and how we expose things afterwards. Um, we do have um, d strong differences in data processing steps. Um, it doesn't come as a surprise to you that CERN obviously has um, quite some big data stuff going on. Um, and we do have um, very um, evident reduction steps in data processing, which results in very small data sets that are actually being shared, partially at least, um, at the with the final publications, for example. We do have differences in collaboration size, and I'm, that might seem a bit weird why I mentioned this explicitly, but this, since we are talking about um, tracking things, this here uh, has a strong impact, or could have a strong impact on um, how you credit people. Do you credit, um, is authorship and contributorship the same if you are part of a 3,000 people collaboration, which is, um, happens at CERN? Is it the same if you um, build software yourself as a one single authored um, piece? Um, you know, these are the kind of um, questions we are asking. Um, and I know I'm asking more questions here than giving solutions right now, but <laughs> that, yeah, that is um, the idea. So um, what is also different is the typology of dynamic data, um, which also has an impact on um, how to track um, research objects um, or how to develop metrics. Um, is this a longitudinal study in the social sciences, for example, or um, is this um, s versioned um, software, for example, could uh, fall under this uh, category too? Um, complexity and dependencies with other objects. Um, very um, complex, I have to admit, oops, I'm sorry, um, at CERN, because um, you know we share the data for the Higgs boson discovery, for example, but you cannot use it if you, we don't, you don't have the ana analytical software with it. I mean, we, we need to express this somehow, and um, I personally also think that might have an impact on um, you um, track, maybe not track, but how you assess um, things afterwards, but that's maybe a topic for a very separate discussion. So, um, what did I wanted to show you? Uh, I wanted to show you in very um, quick, um, walk through, um, then there is a lot of stuff coming your way, um, our way. <laughs> um, I heard that there are many librarians here in the room, um, so you might be a little shocked um, by um, the um, different types of content that are coming in, or you are not shocked because you think it's um, already non-traditional and um, or it's already traditional and not non-traditional anymore. I don't know. Um, and um, so um, what I try to tell you is um, we have been building a lot in both 
um, cases, um, certain and also um, data verse on um, data citation practices. Uh, we do build on data citation and software citation as well. Um, you might have heard about the GitHub integration we have been doing. Um, so we try to expand this to um, um, other alternative metrics for these other non-traditional objects um, because we believe it's um, quite a good way to engage the community because um, for this to work, we need to engage the community. They need to share first and then they can reuse, etc. But um, if we don't um, get them to, sh to share these research objects first, it's hard to track anything afterwards. Um, we do have some challenges um, that I briefly mentioned before. Um, some of them are closed objects. I personally, that's w one of my um, day jobs to understand how we can solve this at CERN um, because we have a long, very long collaborative uh, working phase in doing which um, there's already quite an active uh, reuse within the collaborations happening. So we need to track things internally before we expose and we already have lots of data um, on reuse before it actually goes out, potentially goes out. Um, and then last challenge, um, dynamic um, data and versioning. Um, but I think we are not the only ones suffering from this. So thank you very much you very for much. listening to my quick... Uh, <laughs> lot to learn and very uh, informative. Thank you. And you can find Sunya in the break at the end of this session. Uh, oh, good. Thanks. So uh, next up, we have uh, Martin Fenner from Dataverse. Sorry, Datasite. Beg your pardon. Yes. <laughs> Okay, huh? so I will be talking the next uh, 15 minutes or so about metrics for data and I will be talking about a research project that started 12 months ago around the last conference 1 a.m. Um, called Making Data Count. And this project is a project funded by the national U.S. National Science Foundation with three partners, California Library, PLOS and Data One. You find more information at this project page. And I have to apologize, I was forced by two people in the audience to use Comic Sans for my <laughs> first two slides, so now I switch to something more reasonable. <laughs> um, so the goals of the project are pretty simple. What kind of metrics for research data do researchers and data managers want? Um, do data repositories provide these kind of metrics? And if not, and that's sort of the assumption in the grant proposal, um, let's build these metrics using Data One repository network as a, as a source of data sets. And for the first two questions, that was work that was mainly done by the California Library and Jennifer Lynn in the room also participated in this. This was published um, two months ago as a data paper. And the main conclusion was very consistent what we hear from other surveys or informal discussions. For data, number one for everyone is uh, citation in journal articles. That's what everybody wants. And second place is downloads of data. And then there's sort of lots of things that some people are interested in but nobody really thinks are important and that includes um, social media activity and things like that. So our first conclusion and that is also consistent with literature review we did and the discussion we had since is that what we really should focus on is citation and downloads. And then of course the next question is um, the question for the repository data managers in the survey, what are you actually doing? And what is interesting is the discrepancy between the data repositories have and the data repositories exposed. So you see for example in downloads, most of them have some sort of download stats, but users don't see them. And that's also true for the other metrics. So, sort of for the, that was work that was in the, in the first few months of the project. So we started out to, to build citations and better download stats for the Data One repository network. That's about 25 data repositories, mainly in the US and mainly in geosciences. 
and that is about 150,000 data sets and from quite diverse um, kinds of data and also different repositories that have different policies, etc. And we used, that was sort of the PLOS part in this, we used the open source software that PLOS was running for several years um, to track and collect and aggregate these metrics. And the first thing we had to do is sort of adapt this software to work for things that are not articles and don't have DUIs. And that was sort of, um, so for example, that we have to say what kind of thing is this. So you see here that's a, a t work type data set and that we have sort of all kinds of things in the system. Um, and more importantly, persistent identifiers in data one from the 140,000 data sets, about 60% had DUIs. Second largest number of identifiers was ARCs, but there was also all kinds of other identifiers and we w had to sort of work around to handle this and also we had to sort of build a pipeline where whatever when a new data set was added to the network that we sort of import in the system, start collecting metrics, etc. Then we started tracking citations and of course you can do this in several ways. Uh, the easiest way is the data repository putting this in the metadata that they sent to data one or to data site if it's DUIs to just say this paper has cited the data set and some repositories are really good in this um, and then it's sort of easily available. Uh, you can of course also go through the reference list of articles, um, for example in Crossref and see are there um, references to data sets in there and that's something that is more ongoing work in the DUI event tracker project that was mentioned yesterday by Jeff Builder with Crossref. That's not something where we have a lot of input in, in this 12 months project yet. And the third part is other ways to collect data citation. And one big challenge is that data are not always cited in reference lists. They're the kind of stuff that Crossref sees, for example. But there can be a data citation, can be a URL or DUI in the method section or somewhere else in the paper. So one way to do this, and that's currently the best way, is to do a full text search. And you need APIs and you need open access content for this. Uh, so one good data source we found is um, PubMed Central. It's not a perfect fit because, as I said, the data mostly from geosciences and not, not so much life science, but there's a lot of overlap in the data. And that's an area where more work is needed because I'm pretty sure we are missing a lot of things uh, by this approach. Something that I'm not showing in, in any detail is that we didn't find many data citations. So if we find three citations for a data set, we are happy. There are no data sets where we find 50 citations or something like that. And part of this is, of course, the, the methodology. As I said earlier, data are cited not in reference list, but in the text. The text is closed up. You have no access, etc. But there might also be something else, which is that people cite a paper that talks about the data and they don't cite a data set. So something we did, uh, what we call second order events, is the, the paper associated with the data set, so in many cases there is a paper and a data set published together, uh, track the citations for the papers. And these, these are some examples, again, uh, from PubMed Central, where we have this track the citations and they're all in the system to the data sets. And what's missing to do is to go all through citations and figure out when they're citing, that's really hard, what, what are actually citing and, and how much is that citation of the data and it's used as a proxy. The downloads part, um, the first step you have to do is aggregate the user stats from all the different data one mem member nodes in, in data one and they have been using the doing this before. And then we had to sort of parse the log files using um, standard approaches. And what we decided in the beginning of the project that we would use counter, which is the standard for use slash logs for journal articles for quite a while. And what counter mainly does is two things. Um, look at double click intervals. So if somebody goes to web page and downloads the same thing 10 times in, uh, in a minute, it doesn't count as 10 downloads. And the other one is whitelist. So um, not everything that downloads something is, is, is counted. And in counter, it's 
it's basically the idea only humans are counted, not machines. So if there's Googlebot going through a site, that's not counted. And um, well, actually, I should have said blacklisting, but it's sort of it's a constant battle, and that's one of the challenges with counter that there is not a list of things, and it doesn't change in five years. Um, and we basically applied these rules, or we, I should say, Data One, Matt Jones, uh, Peter Slaughter. Um, and we did a little modification because we felt, well, for data sets, maybe there is a reasonable use of machines using that. So we did a counter compliant usage count and a partial compliant count where we didn't exclude things, uh, where it all goes by the user agent that is sent to the web server. So if something is a Ruby or Java client analyzing the data, we felt that's appropriate. And if it's not something like Googlebot or something like that. And um, this slide is sort of, because probably many people in the room have, have uh, heard about this project, but this is something fairly new and it's very preliminary um, because the collection of use stats that we actually have enough data and aggregate that's just a few weeks old. So the main conclusion is that when you clean up the counts, what you end up with is about two thirds of it. So there's, there's uh, significant bots, et cetera, in there. And that shouldn't surprise anyone who has worked with counter logs which basically is sort of a confirmation that every user, every download count you see about a data set is basically a number which is bogus. Um, and that's because that's not different from other counts on the web that there has to be some cleanup necessary. And also um, that including or not including sort of good machines and taking that as legitimate use is makes very little difference. So the, 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 so the short answer is, if you do exactly the same kind of use stats for data sets as you do for journal articles for quite some time, you're probably 95% there. And there's work going on, working with counter on making this sort of standardized, et cetera. And maybe one outcome is that there's a little, doing something a little bit different with data sets. Um, but we have to analyze the use stats in more detail. And that's sort of the remainder of the work that we have in this project in the next few months. Um, we need to look more at the citations in, for example, the second order citations I mentioned. We still have to do some work on exposing the data in reporting tools and search, et cetera. And then we also have to think, this was a 12 month research grant, how to turn this into a service because that's sort of useful information and it's something that there's no reason to sort of turn the system off in, off in a few months and just do the next research project. And um, one direction this can go, and this is sort of something we're doing in data site, is to use exactly the same approach for things that are in data site, uh, collecting the data in the background for everything in there. And that's something that started very recently. Um, so there's only a few thousand data sets in there. But here, for example, from a different data set from Pangea, which is a geosciences database in Europe, you can just search for data sets, and then you can also see the citations associated with that data set. And with that, I want to mention everybody involved in this project is on the slide. Um, I think Jennifer Lim is the only other person in the room. So, and thank you for your attention. There is a minute or so for questions for Martin. If not, oh yes. So really quick question, uh, Stacy Conkill from Altmetric here. Um, really quick question, not necessarily related to what you presented, but instead the research questions uh, that kind of uh, w formed your project. Um, one of the questions was, what metrics do repository managers want to see? And I wonder, um, why you chose to ask that question, I guess, because it reminded me of that uh, Henry Ford quote, if you asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Like, should we maybe be thinking ahead of what people think they want? Maybe more a comment than a question, actually, but here you go. Well, I think the short answer, this was a 12 month grant. <laughs> Great, thank you, Martin. We'll move on now to uh, Martin. Oh, you got it? Yeah. Oh. 
Okay, good. Martin, Martin uh, from Springer. Okay, yeah. Um, so I have a, a, a bit of a daunting task because if I look at the program, there's coffee now. Oh, good. <laughs> I was about to say, because there's then also uh, the cake that we promised you this morning. So I would be not only standing between the coffee, but also between the cake. So, good. Uh, so, uh <coughs> yeah, I want to tell, uh, tell you something about book metrics. And I, I was very much tempted to, to call this uh, presentation actually the forgotten species, because we've been talking uh, the past two days largely about articles and journals. Uh, and we've completely neglected uh, pretty much the books. Uh, and uh, as a result, at the moment, I really have no clue which of the books are relevant to me other than their cover. And since Springer standardized all the book covers, also that is a, <laughs> a little bit of a challenge. <laughs> <coughs> now, the good thing is that uh, we were uh, uh, nominated for the Alps Award, uh, and so I have a two-minute video <laughs> that I want to show you, uh, and then I don't have to talk anymore, <laughs> and I hope it works. Uh, yeah. Here we go. <laughs> Okay, is there anything else to say? Of course. Because if you write a book, there's actually there's no recognition from faculty, university administrators or funders. Very frustrating, and uh, about 16% of, uh, of the entries for the last year's uh, REF were books, and they hardly don't count. Uh, and there's a huge focus, as I already mentioned earlier, on journal articles. Uh, and uh, largely underscored in, in databases like ISI and Scopus. So, for example, if we take the Springer book um, and we look in ISI, we have um, 10,000 books. Hmm. Not bad. Uh, well, Scopus has already 60,000. And how many books do we have? 
230,000, so only one third is covered in Scopus. <laughs> and I can't go to the authors and say, oh yeah, mm, uh, we have a nice platform, uh, and your book might be cited, but uh, only uh, one third is uh, uh, indexed. Um, and actually, books are, index of, uh, are cited a lot, a lot more than we thought that they would be. So um, across uh, 100,000 books that were published from the, the beginning days of Diesel, and up until now, on average, we find 20 citations per book. So that means that the citation half-life of a book is a lot higher than we thought it would be. And so here you see a breakdown of the citation average uh, citations per copyright year for all of the books that we published, well, a fair bit of the books. And you can see here that the citation half-life is really quite high. And it's not only the citations, it's also the mentions, the altmetrics, uh, what we have been talking about over the past days. So here we, uh, I looked at uh, the, the number of mentions that we have to books published before the year 2000. So that's the year, well, not that year particularly, but, but there was no altmetrics in 2000. There was no Facebook, Twitter, uh, there was no, well, online. You could say do something online, but it was rather primitive. Uh, nonetheless, to the books that were published before 2000, we have 42,000 mentions to these nearly 90,000 books. And here you have an example, uh, published in 1991. And you see here, suddenly there was a spark, uh, and somebody s started to talk about uh, this particular book. And you see a whole bunch of discussions on Twitter, Facebook, uh, Google+, Plus, and a, uh, a probably a blog post that, that triggered it. But anyway, so... Even old content is still highly discussed. And you can see that also here, uh, the archival content is uh, discussed online even up until very uh, old books. Now Springer, uh, oh sorry, Bookmetrics is a, is a Springer Nature product, uh, but it's uh, built on, uh, on technology uh, by Altmetric and we have a very good uh, partnership there. Um, and uh, what I want to say is stop judging books by the cover, really. Uh, how are we doing with time? Ah, then I can still continue. <laughs> 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 so where do we find it? <laughs> I thought I had to rush. Um, <laughs> at the moment, the, o the, the, the way into Bookmetrics is uh, on Springerlink and Springer.com. And you find a little table there, and it's for free. Uh, you don't need to have access to Springer books or to <laughs> Springer uh, yeah, material. You can find citations, mentions, readers, click on that, uh, and you go to the details page. Now, where do we get our data from? Uh, the data comes from Crosswhere for the citation, from Altmetric uh, for the mentions, uh, um, from Mendeley for the readers. The reviews co come from uh, um, Springer, <laughs> and the downloads are counter-compliant data from uh, Springer in this case. So this is where you then go. This is the details page for the books, uh, and you see this is a roll-up of the entire book, and we even narrowed it down to the, to the chapter. So if you're a chapter author, you can also look up your data. You can find here the citations, mentions, readers, downloads, and uh, reviews. Uh, yeah, so this I just mentioned. And uh, so this is the, the Altmetric data uh, with the donut, but without the score, and you can see who has been tweeting about your book or who has been discussing your book in the blog. Uh, similar for Mendeley, gonna skip that a little bit, sorry. And this is the other side, uh, which is really cool for us as Springer. Um, so we have, in this enormous database now, also a dashboard for ourselves with 200,000 books on a nice shelf, like Apple do. <laughs> and we can see immediately which are really the cool books or the, the books that did well. Uh, and so in this case, I filtered uh, the year 2000 14 for the year of publication and the discipline neuroscience and I filter by citations, but I can, I can also uh, sorry sort, I can also sort them by uh, mentions or whatever else, and I can see that this particular book had uh, 64 citations, even though it was only published in uh, in 2014, so one year old, and it has over 23,000 downloads. And the same I can also do on the chapter level and find uh, the chapters that are really cool. So you get the list of chapters. Now with the data, we can download the data and we can al also start to benchmark the data and see which are the disciplines. How do the books differ between disciplines? We had no knowledge of that or hardly any. 
And so here is a couple of disciplines that I took and I benchmarked them. Uh, and you can see that some of the some of the disciplines have very low citations, and others have uh, sorry the other way around, have very low citations, and others have very high citations, uh, or downloads. And you see that uh, this one has a huge number of downloads. This particular discipline, um, and you can start to compare books a lot more. For example, this is one book series that has over eight hundred uh, books in the in the series. And I sorted them uh, to the number of downloads here. And you can see that there are books that have uh, very little downloads, but they actually have a lot, a lot, a lot of citations, <laughs> some of them. And we begin to see a, a, a little bit of a correlation between uh, um, the number of online mentions and the downloads. So the, the green cloud is over here, and that correlates a little bit with the gray one. We have, it's, as I said, it's, it's, we're only scratching the surface, but this is uh, very interesting data. And so, yeah, that's now it's really what I had to say. <laughs> are there, are so there any questions? Yeah, Sorry. there is uh, your two, your two minutes <laughs> for <laughs> any questions for Martin. Where was the question? <laughs> At the moment, it's only for Springer Books, yes. Uh, so what? Uh, so the guys from Altmetric they did a fantastic job. I have to uh, mention that here, uh, and they built this platform. Um, and this is officially it's a, it, it's a prototype. I think it's a lot better than a, a, a general prototype. Uh, but we need to do some further development before we can explore uh, other publishers. Just one more question. Is it also n a new revenue model for Springer authors? No, that's why I had to slide it free. No. Yeah, if there is one more question. Yeah, a super quick question. Um, so Springer publishes a ton of edited volumes, right? And yep. so I'm wondering uh, if you have, a, on the top of your head, like a ratio of uh, uh, what part of the of the books universe you're talking about is actually monographs versus edited volumes. Because I presumably th these two objects have very different types of citation patterns and usage patterns, right? Yeah, that, that's work we're starting to, to explore now. So there's, there's actually many more types. So you have monographs, uh, uh, contributed volumes, but also, for example, the, the uh, major reference works, encyclopedias, um, and, and proceedings are in there as well. So there, there are so many different types. And I, you know, this, for example, is a contributed volume series. So there's many more online mentions than than uh, for the monographs, uh, but it's only yeah we still we have to do a lot more work on that and and hopefully maybe next year we can publish a white paper on that. Great, thank you and thank you to all uh, panelists and I will now uh, s release you to your break. Oh wait. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the next session will be on celebrating five years of Metrics Manifesto. And to celebrate that, we have a cake standing outside. Uh, now, you can't eat cake and then go to the train. <laughs> so if you eat cake, you have to come back for that session. <laughs> That's the deal. Um, one more thing, one more thing before anyone leaves. And one more thing from Jennifer. Yes, who attended Simon Singh's session yesterday? Please raise your hand. Who has heard of the UN, excuse me, HCR, the UN Refugee Agency? Okay, well, Simon has generously decided that all proceeds of his book made available yesterday, some of which, many of which you picked up, will go to UNHCR. We would like to offer anyone who's interested to also contribute and make a donation. There is a box right by the registration table for cash, et cetera. Those who forgot to maybe um, offer your contribution <laughs> in return for the book yesterday, we encourage you to do so today. <laughs> Enjoy the cake. Please come back for the last session. Sorry you felt rushed right when you got in. I think there, was yeah. there were two pages for the program.